I would like to mention, say shalom to you all and welcome to the morning, Friday morning Bible classes of the Holy Scriptures in Israel. Let me remind you that we are studying the Bible together every Friday morning, Friday evening, and Shabbat afternoon, where we study the three books uh, in the Word of God. We are studying Ephesians uh, every Friday morning. We are studying the book of Daniel every Friday evening. And every Shabbat afternoon, we are studying the Gospel uh, of Yohanan, the Gospel of John. And we are very thankful if you can join us, and we pray that the Lord will bless His Word and be honored as we learn from the Word of God together. So why don't we just pray together and ask the Lord to bless us uh, for uh, uh, today's meeting for this Friday morning uh, Bible class. So Abba, our Father, we want to thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the person of the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, and we ask that You will bless our time together, together now as we study Ephesians chapter 1. We ask it all in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So please, uh, beloved brothers and sisters, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Very beautiful uh, book that presents before us the blessing, the spiritual blessings that we have been blessed with in the heavenlies. Those of us that belong to the body of Christ, to the body of Messiah. All of us who are saved by the grace of God, we are so blessed because of what the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, have done for us. We have covered uh, thus far up to verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 1. In this session, I would like to continue from verse 13 we will not conclude the chapter today, but I want to read from verse 13 up to verse 23. These 10, 11 verses. So if you please follow me in your Bible in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. And Apostle Shaul, Paul, who was the Apostle to the Gentiles, to the uncircumcision, he continued to write to the Ephesians uh, brothers and sisters. And he says to them in verse 13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Verse 15, Shaul Paul continues and he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believed according to the working of his power, which he wrought in Christ, in Mashiach, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, to the assembly, to the kehilah, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. 
And here, beloved brothers and sisters, I stop to read uh, the remaining portion of the chapter, Ephesians chapter 1, from verse uh, 13 uh, to the end of the chapter. Now here we are, we are studying the book of Ephesians, and the apostle Paul is writing this letter to brothers and sisters, believers, who live in the city of Ephesus. The intention was that this a letter will be circulated and others will benefit from the information that Apostle Paul present before this local assembly in Asia Minor, the city, in the city of Ephesus. To remind you that in Asia Minor we have other cities like Smyrna and Laodicea and Philadelphia and Sardis and Tyra and, and Pergamon and so on and others benefited from this letter they, 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 the letter intended to circulate among all the believers from among the nations of the world who came to believe in the person of the Lord Jesus the Messiah and became part of the assembly as we know it, the ecclesia the called out ones that are both Jewish and Gentiles, believers in the present age in which we live in, the church age, those who are believers in the Messiah in this present day. Israel, of course, is still waiting the day of restoration. And now the church is being built, and the church, the ecclesia, in Hebrew we call it the kehilah, is a heavenly company with heavenly hopes, with heavenly promises. We belong to the Lord Jesus, the Messiah in heaven, and he will ultimately take us to be with him. Now, of course, we belong to him already today, but our hopes and our promises are not here, uh, ultimately in, uh, in glory, in heaven. So as we think of the Ephesus and of the Ephesian brothers and sisters, they were chosen by the Lord already from before the foundation of the world. And so we have covered so far, beloved brothers and sisters, a few important things. We said that the, from verses 4 to verse 14, we see that all the three persons of the Godhead were involved in the spiritual a blessings that God had provided for those that belong to him. We mentioned that Paul already in verse 3, I think this is one of the main verses, verses 3 and 4, and I just want to read it to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all or with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so after he said that, to remind the Ephesians that they were chosen. They were chosen in Christ, in the Mashiach. It was not something they have done. It is all that which he, Christ, the Messiah, has done on their behalf, on our behalf. And so now that he has said this to them, in verses uh, 4, all the way in verses 5, I should say, we read on all the blessings that have been uh, poured upon us because of the Father, because of the Son, and because of the Spirit. Ha'aba, ha'ben, ha'ruach. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So in verses 4, 5, and 6, we have already learned about the blessing that God the Father had blessed these believers, the Ephesians, and all of us who belong to the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. We have learned that we were predestinated. We have learned that we have become adopted. We have learned that it all was according to the pleasure of His will. We learn that it was done according to the, and in light of the praise and the glory of the Lord. And we have been brought into, we have been brought into such a wonderful relationship. Then we have also learned in verses 7 to verse 12, which we have covered in our previous week together, that it's not only God the Father who planned it all, and the counsel of the Godhead, of course, but it was God the Son who provided redemption. As man, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah, God the Son, he had to take union, humanity with his divine nature in order to pay 
for the price of our salvation. And so we read from verse 7 to verse 12 that he had redeemed us. We were redeemed by the precious blood of the Messiah. He has forgiven us. We were forgiven because of the fact that he paid for our sins. This is verse 7a and verse 7b. We have also learned in verse 8, 9, and 10 that he revealed to us God's will. And I uh, emphasize a little bit that uh, verses 8, 9, and 10 about that mystery. You remember what we read in verse 9? Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. And we have learned, beloved brothers and sisters, that the Bible teaches us of the mysteries or various mysteries which is hidden from the unbelievers, but it is revealed to all of us that have trusted the Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. Notice what it says. I'm just going to mention them just quickly. We have already spoke about it. In, uh, in Matthew 13, 11, we have the mystery of the kingdom of God. In uh, Romans eleven twenty five 25, we have the mystery of Israel's present and partial blindness. In 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians 15, as well, we have the mystery of the rapture of the church. In uh, Ephesians 3, including Ephesians 1, we have the mystery of the body of Christ, the body of Messiah, Jew and Gentile united together in the body of Mashiach. In uh, Ephesians 5, we have the mystery of the church as the bride of Christ, as the bride of the Messiah. In Galatians 2 and Colossians 1, we have the mystery uh, of Christ in the believer, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Messiah in you, the hope of glory. In uh, uh, um, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, we have the mystery of godliness, God manifested in the flesh. How is it possible? This is a mystery that was revealed to us. Of course, the Hebrew prophet spoke about the coming Messiah who will be the the seed of the woman, who will take a, a union, humanity with his divine nature. And the promise of the Messiah was given to us, but in the fullness of the time, God placed in the womb of Miriam the seed, and the Messiah was born. Uh, the uh, the God man was born. This is amazing. The mystery of godliness. First Timothy chapter three and verse sixteen. In Second Timothy chapter two and verse seven, we have the mystery of iniquity. This is the iniquity that is already began when when the Antichrist will do the evil that he was that he will do, and under the influence of Satan, specifically during the tribulation period. And then we also in Revelation one we have the mystery of the seven stars. Revelation one and verse twenty, and and at the end in Revelation seven. 17 and verse 5 and 7, we have the mystery of Babylon. Babylon will ultimately be destroyed. While Babylon, which represents the sinful world in which we live in, who deny God, seem to think that we will continue forever and ever and ever in such a way, yet the Bible tells us that uh, Babylon the Great will be ultimately destroyed. And the mystery of Babylon have been revealed to us who are believers as we read it in Revelation chapter 17 and verses uh, uh, 5, uh, 6, and 7. And so we have read these verses concerning the person of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. He has redeemed us. He had forgiven us. He revealed to us God's will. And then also he has made us uh, to have an inheritance. We have also read in uh, verse uh, 9 and 10 about the inheritance that we as believers will uh, receive because we belong to the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Now, another thing that I really want to emphasize before we will even move on uh, to the next uh, verses is the word dispensation. Brothers and sisters, please bear with me because in verse 10, we have the word that in the dispensation, dispensation of the fullness of the time. What does it mean, dispensation? We have already pointed to it a little bit in our previous meeting together. 
The word dispensation in scripture, it simply comes from the Greek word oikonomia, and that word oikonomia or economy is a, a period of time in which God deals with mankind in a different way. God doesn't change. He remains the same. But the way in which he is having his economy here in this world change. And so in Scripture, we have more, more, most Bible teachers believe that there are seven dispensations that are found in the Word of God. In other words, seven period of time in human history, during which time God is dealing with humanity somewhat differently. God does not change. His expectation for men do not change. But his dealing with men does change. That's why we read in verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of the time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, in the Messiah. This is verse 10. And that word dispensation is very important to understand. Because there are seven dispensations that are found in the Word of God, and I will just give it to you right now. If you have a pen and a paper, just that you will write this down, and later on you can investigate a little bit more about these seven dispensations. As I mentioned, the word is oikonomia in the Greek, and it is simply means an administration. It's an age. It is economy. And it is a period of time and a way in which things are run. You know, every country have a different economy. Every uh, family have a different economy. Some people can manage with a lot more. Some people can manage with a lot less. And every family have a different, we might say, dispensation or way whereby they are dealing with their home uh, the way they manage themselves. Now, notice that in the seven dispensation, listen to that. Let me just give it to you. Um, it is very interesting because every dispensation began with a new information that God gave to that head or to the leader of that dispensation, but it ultimately ends with a human failure. Not God's failure, but human failure. Each dispensation also ends with judgment. God ultimately judges the failing men, the failing people. He ultimately disciplined them, but it all began with a different, different era, different period of time, different age in human history. The first dispensation is called the dispensation of innocency. This is beginning in uh, Genesis 2, verse 7, and it's run all the way to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 22, 23, and 24. This is the dispensation of innocency. In Hebrew, we call it chaput mipesha. That's a period of time where there was no sin. Man was innocent, and he enjoyed the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden, to be in the presence of God. But he failed. Sin came in when men ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and judgment came. The second dispensation is the dispensation of conscience. Now that men fail, he received conscience. In Hebrew, it is called matzpun. It's like a gauge whereby he is gauged to see the wrong that he does and the right that he does, and his conscience is pricked when he is going in a wrong way. And this began in Genesis 4 verse 1 and end at Genesis 7 and verse 24. Again, failure came there as well. The third dispensation is called the dispensation of human government, of responsibility. In Hebrew, we call it achrayut, achrayut. That dispensation began from Genesis 8 and verse 1 and ended in Genesis 11 and verse 32. 
And you remember, it was from the coming out of the ark, when, when Noah came out of the ark, until the building of the Tower of Babel. Again, a new beginning, a new manner whereby God have dealt with humanity, a new age, human responsibility, and what we learn that men under responsibility fail once again. Once again, men have failed. The fourth dispensation is called the dispensation of promise. In Hebrew, it is called the dispensation of havtacha. God made a promise. At that dispensation began with the call of Abraham, the Hebrew, and that is when God has elected a chosen people, an earthly people, namely the nation of Israel. It began from Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, when God called Abraham our father, until Exodus chapter 18 and verse 27, when God gave the law to the people of Israel who came out of the land of Egypt. So from the call of Abraham until Mount Sinai, that is called the dispensation of promise. God called a people unto himself and made to Israel unconditional promises to the nation. That's called the dispensation of promise. Fifthly, scripture teaches us about the dispensation of the law, the Torah. God gave the law to the people of Israel, and Israel obviously had failed to submit to that law. Israel had failed to submit to that law, but within that law that God had given to Israel, he never gave this dispensation to Israel, the law, in order to be saved through it. Of course not. That's why he gave the sacrificial system. So when sin came in, the blood will be atoning for the sin of the nation. That's why you have Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. Israel failed to submit to the law of God. In fact, all of us, if we were there, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. None could fulfill God's high standard. That's why the sacrificial system was given to point to the coming Messiah, to the coming Redeemer. And so the dispensation of the law began from Exodus chapter 19 and verse one, and it ended really in Matthew chapter 1 when the Messiah came to this world. And we can say in the Gospel of Matthew because ultimately the Messiah died on that shameful cross, Matthew chapter 27, and paid for the sin of this world. And the, when he said, it is finished, John 19, the law come to an end. Though God's law, in its, it's intact in a sense of God's holiness, and men cannot still, they cannot continue to violate God's law, but the period of time, the dispensation, the age, the economia, the economy or the administration of the law ended when the Mashiach have come to pay for the sin of this world. That is the dispensation of law. Now we live today, beloved brothers and sisters, in the dispensation of grace. In Hebrew we call chesed. And this dispensation really began from the time that the Lord Jesus the Messiah finished the work on the cross. Then he died, he was buried, he rose again, and he was ascended to heaven. And then he sent the Holy Spirit of God, and he began to build the body of Christ, the body of Messiah for this present age in which we live in. So we can say that this dispensation of grace begins really in Acts chapter 2, or at the end of the Gospels, after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah and the coming of the Holy Spirit, and it does continue 
all the way until the rapture of the assembly, the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. This age in which you and I live in today is an amazing age. It is an age, it is a dispensation, it is an oikonomia, it is an age, it is an administration, it is a way in which God runs things in this world during this day whereby the gospel is preached and Jew and Gentiles who come to know the Mashiach, the Messiah, become part of that heavenly company, that one body of which the apostle Paul described here in Ephesians chapter 1, seeking to instruct the believers at Ephesus. And it will end at the rapture of the church. Now again, even during this dispensation of grace, men fail as well. We, as part of the assembly, the church fail as well. Look at the condition that the church is existing today, especially in the church of the Laodicean in the days in which we live in. So we fail under the law, but we also fail under grace. And that is a, 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 to show us that when men come to his responsibility, men fail at all times. Not God, but men. Not the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. No, but men fail in every time. And God calls us in every dispensation to seek to be faithful to him to seek to submit to him, and when we sin, to repent, to confess our sins, and to turn to him. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, this age in which we live in will end at the rapture of the church. And that's why the Apostle Paul mentioned that uh, having made known unto us in verse 9, 10, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he had purpose in himself, why? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together. Notice that. He might gather together, how wonderful it is, in one all things in Christ. Now, of course, that is not yet uh, have happened, but we are part of those that belong to the age in which we are, uh, the Lord is reaching out to all men to bring many to be part of the ecclesia, of the body of Christ, but ultimately Christ or God will gather together all things, not only all men, but even all things in a future day in the eternal order where there will be everything placed in order because of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord Jesus Christ. What wonderful desire God has, and He will accomplish this. In the dispensation, in the age of the fullness of the time, when all these ages will come to an end, and finally God will bring about all things under the Christ, He will ultimately be the one who will... Uh, 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 you might say reign and rule and and have the pleasure of seeing all the redeemed to be with him whether it is in heaven whether it is on earth all things will ultimately be subject unto him and it is all because of what Yeshua Jesus the Messiah have done for us when he died for us uh, on the shameful Roman cross now notice one more dispensation and that is the seventh dispensation and that is called the dispensation of the Messianic kingdom. This is also an age. This is also a period of time where God will deal with humanity in a different way in administration. The Messiah will reign and rule, and he will rule in righteousness. But when sin will arise, he will judge it immediately. And beloved brothers and sisters, even in this dispensation of the a Messianic kingdom, we call it Malchut HaMashiach, for a thousand years, even this dispensation will come to an end after the thousand years will be over. And you remember what will happen again, the failure of men. When the thousand years will be over, Satan will be loosed. Men will follow him, the youth movement of the 
of the uh, of the messianic kingdom will ultimately follow satan and then god the messiah will judge him even that dispensation when the messiah will rule in righteousness sin will still be there that's why he has to judge sin quickly he will rule in righteousness but sin will still occur during the thousand years reign of the messiah in fact isaiah 65 tells us that a sinner will die at a 100 years of age in other words sin will be there the messiah will judge it but that dispensation will come to an end with man's failure and that dispensation begin from revelation 19 verse 1 the second coming of the messiah when he will come at his second coming and it will end in revelation 20 and verse 15 after the great white throne judgment from there on we will have the eternal order and that's what we learn here in verse 10 of ephesians chapter 1 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him beloved brothers and sisters everything and i repeat this everything is in christ in the mashiach without the mashiach without the messiah without god the son who came to this world to become a man of sorrows that had been acquainted with grief to pay for the sin of the of the world without him coming to this world willingly to suffer and die there will not be any hope for anyone that's why it is so important to understand the that everything is in him and that's why it does say in verse 11 in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will verse 12 that we should be to the praise of the of his glory who first trusted in christ in other words everyone who trusted in the lord jesus the messiah will be to the praise of his glory we will be part in, of his inheritance we will enjoy god's presence and god's son the messiah himself and we will be to the praise of his glory how wonderful it will be because we have first trusted in the messiah now please go back with me now to our chapter again and now i want to read uh, in verse uh, uh, in verse uh, 13 and 14 for our session in the last uh, 20 25 minutes that we have left now now that we have learned about the blessing that come from god the father and then the blessing that come from god the son now we learn in verses 13 and 14 of the blessings that we receive because of god the holy spirit ruach ha elohim the person of the Holy Spirit of God. So notice what the what happened here in verses 13 and 14. We see that the Spirit, notice it says in verse 13, in whom ye, in other words, in Christ, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, verse 13 b, also after that ye believed notice that ye were sealed with the holy spirit of promise now that is so important to understand you see in this verse 13 we learn that we who are believers we were sealed notice that at the end of verse 13 with the holy spirit of promise now again notice that the thought of sealing and it is the holy spirit of promise now notice that expression uh, uh, to be sealed you know when the bible is speaking about being sealed it is simply means that we 
uh, not only the Holy Spirit of God came to indwell us, but the fact that He is indwelling us on the basis of our faith in the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, we were sealed. We were, you might say, as if as if God sending a letter, and in the letter He has our name. And when he closed the envelope, he sealed that envelope, he stamped that envelope, we said, and he said, This man, this woman, this person, this boy, this girl, this Jewish individual, this gentle individual, because he or she believed on me, they are mine. They are mine. You remember what Paul said already in the book of Corinthian, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. We belong to the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, because the Spirit of God has sealed us. Not because, again, to to remember this, not because of something that we have done. No. Everything was in the plan of God. We were chosen in a Messiah before the foundation of the world. In time, the Messiah, Christ, came to this world. He died and paid for our sins. Then later on, in time, the message of the gospel was preached unto us. And in time, we responded to that message of the grace of God, recognizing that we are sinners by nature and we need forgiveness of sin. And the Spirit of God had wooed us. The Word of God was presented before us. And we recognize that we are hopeless and helpless without forgiveness of God. And we have invited the Lord Jesus to come into our heart. We have accepted Him as our, as our Lord and as our Savior who died instead of us, who was punished for our sins. And notice how verse 13 emphasizes this. Notice that again. In whom, verse 13a, ye also trusted. You notice the order? We have trusted, but when did we trust? We couldn't trust in him unless we heard the message, right? So it said, we, you have trusted after that ye heard of the word of truth the gospel of your salvation. You see the order? You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we have trusted in Yeshua HaMashiach, in Jesus the Messiah, but we have only trusted in him after that we have heard the message. That's why we are called to go and preach the message. You see, God made it so. He prescribed it so that a message need to be proclaimed. That's why we mess, we share the message on the radio. That's why we have these messages in this, these various ways, whether it is through Zoom or through the uh, YouTube and Facebook or television or in person or from door to door or singing on the streets. Years ago, we were handing out tracts on the highways and byways, whether it is in New York City or whether it is in in Toronto or elsewhere, sharing the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You remember what Apostle Paul said? Turn with me to Romans chapter 10 for a moment. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 10 when he was speaking concerning the necessity to go and share the gospel, and especially in the context of Romans chapter 10, is to share the gospel with the Jewish people. But the gospel has to be shared with all men. But notice what we read. It says in verse 13, <clears throat> Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he continues and he says, Well, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Then he said, secondly, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Thirdly, how shall they hear without a preacher? 
Fourthly, verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, and then fifthly, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of shalom, the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good news. Shaul, Paul, is quoting what Isaiah some 750 years before the coming of the Lord Jesus the Messiah, was recording in his prophecy speaking to the nation of Israel. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. (laughs) You know, we have so many bad things that are going on in this world. Just turn the television. Just open your internet. Just open the newspaper or listen to the radio. And you see how many bad tidings we hear constantly. But oh, to preach the message of the grace of God, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, Amazing, the grace of God in providing salvation, in reaching out to the lost. And this is exactly what happened to you and I, beloved brothers and sisters. Look back at verse 13. Again, listen to this. It says in verse 13, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. And then he continues and he says, in whom, notice that, also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, a person who is not a believer is not sealed by the Spirit of God. No one who rejects the way of God's salvation and the person of the Lord Jesus the Messiah is really is saved. In fact, go back to Romans once again. Romans (coughs) chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, notice what we read in verse uh, 9. Romans 8 and verse 9. And while you open it, I want to read you this verse. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, he's speaking to the believers at Rome, but in the Spirit, if so be, or since so be, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And then he continues in Romans 8 and verse 9b, and Paul Shaul is saying, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, He is none of his. He is not belonging to him. In other words, in order for a person to be saved, to to receive the Holy Spirit of God, he must believe. Otherwise, he or she are not saved, and therefore they are not sealed. They are not belonging to the Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. They are not belonging to God. And that's why verse 13 is so important to understand, because what happened... While God the Father planned it, orchestrated this great salvation, God the Son executed this by coming to this world and paying for the price of the sin of this world. Then God the Holy Spirit sealed everyone that have accepted the Messiah Jesus, saying, you belong to me, you belong to me. And that's how wonderful it is for us to realize that. Sealing represent ownership. Sealing representing security. Sealing is from God, and every believer <clears throat> Every believer in the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, is sealed, belonging to God, and it represents ownership, representing security. No wonder the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, said 
in John chapter 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And then he said, And I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You see, why could he say, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me? John 10. And then I'll give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. How can he say that? Well, he says it because he knows that when one come to know him as his or her Lord and Savior, that person is once and for all belong to God. You cannot be belong to the God one day and then all of a sudden not be belong to God. That's why he says, no man, no man taketh away anyone that belongs to me or, or for out of the hands of my Father. No one can do so. Because a believer in the Lord Yeshua the Messiah is once and for all redeemed and saved. Now, does that mean that the believer doesn't fall into sin? Of course not. But for that sin that the believer committed after his or her salvation, for that same sin, Jesus the Messiah had to pay. He had already died for that sin. The responsibility is to repent, to come to the throne of grace. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But no believer can be unsaved. Otherwise, their salvation is not from God. Not by works, we'll get to it in chapter 2. Not by works which we have done, but according to his mercy at save us. We read it in the book of Titus. In Ephesians 2 and verse 8, we learn, By grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. And so, being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise means that we belong to God once and for all. Being sealed represents ownership, being sealed representing the fact that we are secure. Now just go back with me to John 14, because here the Apostle Paul used that expression, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Well. It was the Lord Yeshua himself who made a promise to his disciples, to his Talmidim in the upper room in the city of Yerushalayim, that he will send to them the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. Notice in John chapter 14 and verse 16, there we read, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. Not for six months. Not for six years. Not as long as you are a pretty decent person. No. He will dwell uh, with you forever. Notice that even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwell with you and shall be in you. That's the spirit of promise which the Lord Jesus the Messiah had promised to the disciples, and he surely uh, fulfilled that uh, promise. This is the promise of the Father. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, as we are drawing here towards the end of this meeting, notice what we read in verse uh, uh, 14, now that he mentioned that the believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, this is what Shaul Paul is saying to the Ephesians, representing ownership, representing security. Now in verse 14, we learn why the Spirit of God was given to us. The Spirit of God was given to us as an earnest that expression, earnest, simply means as a guarantee. It's a guarantee. It says in verse 14, which is the earnest or the guarantee of our inheritance? And it is until, until when? It is until the redemption 
of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. In other words, this person of the Holy Spirit of God is indwelling the believers. And he's given to the believer, to the believer in the Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, as a guarantee that our God is fully going to accomplish all that which he promised to those that belong to him. You see, this world cannot provide any guarantees whatsoever. We know very well, one day we are healthy, the next day we are sick. One day we are well to do, the next day things are falling out and things are not the same. One day we have friends, and other days we don't. They are no longer our friends. One day things seem to work well in our lives. Other days there are valleys and challenges and problems. That's why Yeshua said, In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But you see, one guarantee that we all have, and it is entirely because of the finished work of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, is that we belong to God. No one will be able to take our relationship with the Lord because He saved us, He chosen us, saved us, gave us the person of the Holy Spirit of God as an earnest, verse 14, given us that uh, down payment to guarantee that we belong to him, to guarantee that we have been purchased and that we are his possession. Notice it says here, which is the earnest of our inheritance. It is a down payment of that which will come later. While we already have that positionally, but we will come to full enjoyment of it when we will be taken to be with the Lord in glory. This is the earnest of our inheritance, and it is until the redemption of the purchased possession. You notice what it says here, the redemption of the purchased possession. Well, we are redeemed. We have been purchased. Remember what we have learned already? That the word a, a redeemer or redemption, simply from the Hebrew word, come from the word to buy back. We have already belonged to God by creation. But because we have sinned, we have inherited a sin nature, and we have been at the distance from God, then God had to redeem us. The Hebrew word ligol or geula, the kinsman redeemer, the one who will buy us back again. Like in our people Israel's history, the land was belonged to the certain tribe, but to a certain family. But because of uh, becoming poor, unable to continue to manage the land, they had to sell the land to the neighbor or to somebody else. But then the kinsman redeemer, the goel in Hebrew, the family, the relative, he will come and will buy back that which belonged to his relative. We have been purchased by the precious blood of the Messiah. And in order to become a goel, to become a redeemer, one, one had to be a relative. He had to be able to pay the price. And he also has to be willing to pay the price. You see, like in the days of Ruth, the Moabitish woman, that Boaz was not only relative, was not only able, but he was also willing. While the other one relative was not willing because he says, I don't want to mar my inheritance. But here, beloved brothers and sisters, and with this I will close. You see what the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, have done, the Redeemer? He, first of all, had to be a relative to link with humanity. That's why he took union, humanity. He had to become a man. He couldn't just say, send an angel. 
He couldn't just say, I will redeem you, but the price of sin has to be paid. So in order to pay for sin, he must become the redeemer. He must take union, humanity, and to become like us. Just as we read in uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. There we read, listen to this, Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also himself likewise took part of the same. He became flesh and blood that he through death might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. The Messiah, God the Son, had to become a man in order to become a redeemer. So he became a family, become like us. Secondly, he has to be willing. And you remember what we read in Scripture? Not my will, but thine be done. Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, was willing to come down to this world. Though he was equal with God, he counted not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a, of a man, of a servant. And as a man, he went all the way to the cross and he paid for the sin of this world. This is the Mashiach, the promised Messiah. Of Isaiah 53, they pierced my hands and my feet. And also, beloved brothers and sisters, not only that he was a relative, not only that he was willing, but he also was able. None of us could save another. No other man can save his brother. No one could redeem another. Why? Because we are all tamed with sin. We all have the sin nature. We cannot help anyone else to bring them unto God. The only one that can pay for a sinner is a sinless one, one who knew no sin, the one who did no sin, the one that in him there was no sin. This is only the Mashiach, the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of this world. And so notice that, and I'm closing with this, verse 14. This Holy Spirit of promise that was given to the us, to believers, to the Ephesians, and to you and I, <coughs> became the earnest, the down payment of our inheritance. We have received eternal inheritance, spiritual and eternal inheritance because of the Messiah, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His of the Messiah's glory. In other words, the redemption, look at this. Our soul has been saved. We are redeemed. But we are still here in this world. And our bodies are still in this condition, in this failing condition. One day, beloved brothers and sisters, we will receive a glorified body. And we will be taken out of here and be in the presence of God And we will never anymore dishonor God, never anymore fail God. But we will be as his possession, purchased possession, and it will be unto the praise of his glory. We will ultimately, uh, uh, in, in the very fact that we will be brought unto him, and any believer in any dispensation that knew God by faith, will be presented before God for the glory of our Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. How wonderful to see what our Pastor Paul is seeking to teach their brothers and sisters in Ephesus. And that's why verse 15, which I will not continue. Wherefore, Paul is saying, verse 15, I also, after I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love of to all the saints, I cease not to thank, to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. We will go to it in our next session uh, together, beloved brothers and sisters. So may the Lord encourage us and, 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 and cause us to rejoice in the fact that whatever happened here in this world, we belong. If you are a believer, if you know the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, as your Lord and Savior, you belong. To God, you are his purchased possession. You and I, all those that have trusted 
in the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. So Abba, our Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for what all the three persons of the Godhead have done on behalf of uh, us who are redeemed, every redeemed person. Ha'aba, ha'ben, ha'ruach, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. How thankful are we to you today. Our God and our Father, bless your word, we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, those of you <coughs> that are here uh, with us today over uh, over uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook will say shalom to you. God bless you until the next meeting. We will turn off the, the, the session. And those of you that are on Zoom with us, please hold on. We'll have a time of questions and answers and statements. Okay? So shalom, shalom, everyone. God bless you.